talks about this commonality we have as one suffers, all suffer in the body of Christ. He said in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one, mo- if one member suffers, all suffer together, but if one member is honored, all rejoice together. And this verse in Corinthians really rings with truth when it comes to Acts chapter 5. And we're going to see, but also in the same way, we're going to see that as, as one is honored, all are honored. And then, then, not only that, but we just see this unstoppable force when we unite together in a way that honors God. And that's the thing. God designed the church as a community, as a mutual support. We need one another. And that's kind of the simple thing. And it's time that we're encouraged to, like, not be near each other. I, I'm just adamantly going to say every time from the pulpit, we need each other. And not only that, the reality is, as according to 1 Corinthians, is if one of us suffers, it affects us all. And I think that rings true for any business, any home, or any form of living. You're going to see that one person can affect the entire company, the entire family, the entire church. But my hope is that we see and learn from this story that if we allow humility to guide our actions, powerful things can happen. So let's begin in verse 1 of Acts chapter 5. We're told this. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. Let's stop there for a moment. We, we learned last week in Acts chapter 4 when Barnabas comes onto the scene. Joseph, remember, he was called the encourager. He sold a plot of land, and we're told in Acts chapter 4 verse 37, having land, he sold it, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Acts chapter 5 comes into the picture now with Ananias and Sapphira. They see what Barnabas does, and they're like, that was amazing. In fact, that was amazing, all the recognition he got when he sold the land and brought it to the apostles. Uh, We need to do the same thing. Let's do the same thing. But there was a problem with their motive, because look what happens in verse 2 back in Acts 5. Ananias, that's he, he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, as great and as grand as it may seem that someone, a couple, would come to the apostles and say, hey, we're going to sell a plot of land, and we're going to learn that in verse 3. As great and as grand as that might seem, what we're going to find out through these two is what they were doing was actually quite deceiving. They knew exactly what they were doing. And and by the way, in order for you to wrap your mind around the rest of the story, because this is a heavy story, In order for you to wrap your mind around how and why this happened, you need to understand that Ananias and Sapphira both consensually colluded to perpetuate a fraud in the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, that's hypocrisy. And we're going to see that the the consequences of that. And maybe some of you are looking at it, I mean, like, well, why would they do that anyways? Why would they collude together and formulate this plan to be this fraudulent uh, lie in the name of Jesus. What's the, even the motive behind that? It's pride. Because think about it. Barnabas, from Acts chapter 4, sells the land. They see the recognition that he got. And I think what happened with Ananias and Sapphira, they were like, hey, I want to taste and see how sweet this thing called respect really is. And so they kept back part of the proceeds. His wife was aware of it, and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But no harm, no foul, right? Because how can the apostles ever know? Look what happens in verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the price of the land for yourself? You have to know Ananias' heart beating normal, and then he hears those words. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Because think about it. Acts chapter 4, Barnabas is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he has this this generous approach to say, I want to sell everything, and I want to give everything to the Lord. While Satan filled the heart of Ananias and Sapphira to give out of deceit and recognition. And yet, Peter, who's filled with the Holy Spirit, calls them out. Already knows it. He already knows that they kept part of the price for the land for themselves. And not only that, he calls them out for lying. Look at verse 4 with me. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, 
but to God. Again, I, I need to point out that Ananias and Sapphira, by the way, they didn't have to do anything. Like, hear me out. They didn't have to sell their land and give it to the apostles. It wasn't like, the, you know, Peter has this, like, prosperity pastor approach where, like, God needs your money right now, and more of your money, more prayer comes, and God will listen to your prayer. And by the way, if you hear any prosperity pastor tell you that the more money you give, God hears your prayers better, it's garbage, and you need to stop listening to whoever that is. But that, that's not what's happening here. Like, Ananias and Sapphira were not obligated to do anything, not to mention they were certainly weren't motivated by the Holy Spirit to give. Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly, give my money to the church, always asking for money, not under compulsion, you know, as I'm hovering over you, did you give money to the church yet? No, no. For God loves what? He loves a cheerful giver. We believe here that, again, giving is a form of adoration to the Lord. We worship the Lord with our money. And so when, we, when you hear the pastor at the pulpit, and for me, to say that, it's not because of any other reason except I believe, according to the scriptures, that when we give to the Lord, it is a form of worship. And we're giving to Him because it rightfully always belonged to Him. And as the Lord prompts you, not out of obligation, but, but out of worship, it's powerful. That giving becomes this powerful statement. And not only that, giving was not just a form of worship. We see in Acts chapter 3 and 4 that the early church just had just a generous approach when it came to this. But that didn't happen with Ananias and Sapphira. Like I said, they could have kept the land. They were not obligated to sell the land. They could have, or they could have sold the land and used the proceeds to buy falafels. I don't know. I mean, but the point is this. Uh, they didn't have to sell it if they weren't motivated by the Spirit to give. Honestly, they really could have come to Peter and said something like, hey, Peter, we just want you to know we sold a portion of our, we sold all of our land, but we're just giving a portion to, the, to you guys. And we're just letting you know that because we're going to use the difference for whatever. Like, you know, at least that would have been honest, and at least that would have been approached with a, with a humble attitude. But Peter knew they were lying, and he points out in verse 4, it, while it remained, was it not your own? Meaning the land was always yours to begin with. And after it was sold, he said, was it not in your own control? Meaning, again, the land has always been yours. We didn't tell you to give it back to us. You decided this. And then he finishes it with, well, so then why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You haven't lied to men, but to God. And I want you to notice that he poses two questions in verses 3 and 4 that deal with the heart. He asks in verse 3, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? And then he asks here in verse 4, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Which tells me, because someone asked first service, do you think Ananias and Sapphira were Christians? I, I actually do think so. I mean, there's not any huge indication. It's pure conjecture. But th what it tells me, if that is true, is that Satan can influence the believer, even a spirit-filled believer. And I preface this next thing, and this is so important, that although he can influence you, he cannot control you. More specifically, Satan can't commit the sin for you. He can't. So we can't play that blame-shifting game on Satan. Ananias had conceived the sin in his own heart. Not to mention, Ananias is, isn't being confronted because he lied to Peter. Peter tells him, you haven't lied to men, you lied to God. So what's next? What do you say in response to that? Well, let's see what happens with Ananias in verse 5 and 6. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. What's hard about this passage of Scripture is the, 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 the reality of this biblical concept that our, our sin actually does find us out. In fact, Numbers chapter 32, verse 23 says, Behold, you've sinned against the Lord, and be sure that your sin will find you out. As sneaky, as craft, you know, crafty, as, as great as we think we are at concealing stuff, the reality is it finds us out. And that's exactly what happened with Ananias. Not only that, but the text tells us in verse 5 that his lie being revealed caused him to fall down and breathe his last. But I like the King James translation of Acts 5.5. I'm going to read it to you. Listen to this. 
And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Have you heard that term before? He gave up the ghost. In the Greek, it's exuho, and it means to expire, to breathe out one's last life. And in Ananias' case, that's exactly what happened. His lie killed him. His lie caused him to give up the ghost. And by the way, it wasn't the amount of money that Ananias gave that killed him. That, that didn't kill him. Is again, he lied to God in the name of Jesus to appear a religious, spirit-filled, honoring God, but he was doing it at the expense of wanting to be respected by those who are around him. And you think about it, his deceitfulness caused him to give up the ghost, to expire, to breathe his last breath, to die. And some of you probably hearing this story for the first time are like, are you serious? His lie killed him? I need to tell my children this story, like, right after service. <laughs> but here's the problem. When we look at sin, we measure it differently. This sin is worse than this sin. And, and uh, many of you would sit down right now and you tell me, and I'm like, John, you, there's nothing you can say that can convince me that murdering is not worse than lying. Well, again, the way that we measure it, perhaps, but in God's mind, in, in the scale of morality, in the scale of what is right and wrong, they are always balanced and weigh the same. Listen to this. Isaiah 59, 2. If you're, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's, he has turned away and it will not listen anymore. And, and, and again, sins broadening out all of them. And again, if our sins are not measured up, or our standard, I should say, of sin doesn't match up with God's standard of sin, there is a problem. In fact, Jesus had to address this in Matthew's gospel. Some of you know this story. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. Jesus said, you've heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. And if you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Yeah, we all agree. Murder is bad. Makes sense. But listen to what he says in the next verse, Matthew 5, 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And for a lot of us, it's like, What? Did you just, are you, are you basically measuring anger and murder in the same category? Jesus is. He also said in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And a lot of us in here would be like, yeah, cheating on your spouse is bad. Yeah, cheating on your spouse physically is bad, but that's it. But Jesus said in the next verse, Matthew 5, 28, but I say to you that whoever even looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What? Seriously? Just looking, you're saying, is committing adultery. Again, if our standard of sin doesn't match up with Christ's standard of sin, there's a problem. And not only is there a problem, we see that with Ananias. In his mind, his deceitfulness to the Holy Spirit, what's, what's the point? No, no harm, no foul. And yet he gave up the ghost because of the lie. I also want to point out that Peter wasn't the one who pronounced the death sentence. He simply just confronted him, and then Ananias fell down dead. And honestly, I think, I think Peter was shocked when it happened. You know, it's like, Ananias, you haven't lied to men, but God, thump, huh? And then, like, John walks in. Hey, Peter, you know where the falafel maker is? What'd you do? Like, I think it was just shocking. He wasn't expecting this. But you know what's crazy about sin? When you hear news about people, it's shocking. It is. It, it's, it's a shocking reality when you're, some, it's like, I had no idea. Sin is shocking because Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't be enslaved to it. In fact, listen to this. David Gusick said concerning this, the shock of being exposed was too much for Ananias. For many Christians in compromise, their greatest fear is not sinning itself, look at this next part, but it's in being found out. And I think that's the paralyzing issue with a lot of us here in church. No one can ever know the sin in my life. And you know what I found out about secret sin? It's heavy. Just like if you try to bring in extra luggage when you travel and they weigh it on the scale and they're like, you're one pound over. And it's like, oh, sorry. And they're like, that's going to be an extra 20 bucks. And it's like, one pound. Sin, the extra sin we carry around that we hide it's hard to carry around daily. It's hard. 
And a lot of us, we hear that, and it's like, uh, pastor, move on to the next verse. But that's where the hope of Jesus comes in, because he died on the cross to alleviate the issue of sin. So that not only we, would we not be a slave to it, but we don't have to hide it. Because the reality is, every person in here, we're not exempt from sin. I am going to make mistakes, you're going to make mistakes. The difference is between habitual sinning, where I'm hiding, and sinning because I'm a human. That I'm short sometimes, and I'm, oh, Lord, I shouldn't have been short with the staff, and with my wife, and with my family, and with that person on the road, and I, I'm so, I need your forgiveness, Lord. Versus sin that you guys are know, know what I'm talking about. And in Ananias, it was a very short-lived hiding of sin, but now he's gone. And because of it, great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And these young men came and wrapped him up and buried him, which makes you wonder, so what's going to happen with Sapphira? Look at verse 7 and 8 with me. And it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me what, whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Now we hear, now we're reading this story and it's like, come on, Peter. That was kind of sneaky of you not to share it right away, what happened with his wife. And said, it's, it's almost, it feels like entrapment. But you know what's actually is happening here? He's giving her a chance to fess up. He is giving her a chance that in the conviction, because now the, the church has the Holy Spirit, guys. And she can have this convicted moment where she can say, you know what, I've been lying. And no, we, di we didn't sell it. For, we, we didn't give this much away. We gave this much away. And what was happening is he wants her to give up the act so that she wouldn't give up the ghost like her husband. But she had no idea what had happened. She was going about day to day like, la, 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 no one knows. You know, Ananias is probably somewhere. And it makes you wonder, though, if she ever considered confessing. And can I just say this, church, as you're even hearing me say that, and you, in your own heart of hearts you're thinking about something that maybe you're struggling with, or maybe you know you need to just talk about, can I just, from my experience, both as a human and as a pastor, when you confess, here's the Bible. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble, right? He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The moment you approach anything in life that you know you need, to, you need to confess something that you've been concealing and you approach it with a humble attitude, I'm telling you, God pours out his spirit in ways you never thought. You're so worried about what people are going to think, what that's going to be the outcome. And what I've experienced is that when you approach it with humility and saying, I messed up and here's how and I need help, powerful things happen. But you know what's the occasional lie we hear? Well, I'm this far in, so I might as well be quiet. And that's a lie. And that is such a lie. God loves you and he died on this cross for you so that you wouldn't be a slave to it. And not only that, but he loves you enough so that church shouldn't exist so you feel convicted in the, t on the chair you're sitting in and just feel bad the whole time. But you say, Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that I'm identifying in my heart what needs to change so I can love you more. And that doesn't happen with An Ananias and Sapphira. They have, they have a chance but nothing happens in terms of confessing it. So look what happens in verse 9 through 10. Then Peter said to her, Well, how is it that you agree together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Verse 10, Then immediately she fell at his feet, breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Oh, how the plot thickens. Again, to wrap your mind around this story, guys, we need to understand this was premeditated. This wasn't a transactional mistake where Sapphira was like, I had no idea. That's so weird. My husband told me one thing and you're saying, it. no, she knew exactly what was happening. So it really, and it, it comes down to this, as you're trying to process this in the story of Acts, that Ananias and Sapphira colluded to perpetuate a fraud in the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. And that is hypocrisy, guys. Even though it seems innocent, that it's, it's hypocrisy. And within moments, she hears the news and dies. She fell down at his feet, breathed her last. And you know what's crazy about these stories? I understand God's word is anointed and all, inspired by the Holy Spirit. All of it. But these are stories that you don't go like, what a great story in the Bible. This is a tragic story. That the hypocrisy of two people ended with their deaths. 
just like when we hear stories in the church with people in our church, it's never like, wow, this is amazing. It's like, what a tragedy, man. And it shouldn't just cause, when we hear those stories, just to be like, hm, stinks to be them, if anything, if anything. And that's what I'm hoping. I hope you guys understand. If there's anything you can remember in this sermon, it's this. Lies are always going to destroy lives. They're always, okay? Period. But with humility and with God allowing him to, with God's grace, the church shouldn't exist so when we find out things about you that say, get out of here, I can't believe you even came to this church, but to say, we love you and praise God this surfaced. And it should do something. But what was the result of the early church finding out about Ananias and Sapphira? Look at verse 11. What happened with them? Great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Yeah, seems like a legitimate, like, response in light of what happened. That the great fear filled the church. By the way, that's not a shaking in your boots fear. It's not like a, he's going to come and get me kind of fear. It's a, it's a reverential awe fear. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says that the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom. And, and again, I want you to see the result of a, this healthy, biblical, great fear falling upon the church. What it should do. What the results should be. Look at verse 12 with me. Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. It says, not some, it says many signs and wonders were done. And in the Greek, it implies numerous, it implies an overly repeated thing. It wasn't just like a one or two time thing. It happened all the time. That this reality that we worship an almighty, perfect, and holy God, and the reality of Ananias and Sapphira says, you know what? I love the Lord even more because I'm seeing that I got to take my life seriously and my relationship with the Lord seriously. The signs and wonders that were done among the people, as the text says, at Solomon's porch, I think primarily to confirm and to affirm that the signs and wonders were real. Also, I believe that God, that when God's people are together with one accord, similar to what we're doing now, in unison, even outside of this place, I think it becomes a greater display of the power of the Holy Spirit than any particular sign and wonder. And I'm not saying that to dismiss signs and wonders. By the way, I embrace signs and wonders. I embrace them in their proper biblical context, and, and I embrace them because they're, they're that. They're in the Bible. But I also believe that signs and wonders were done through the acts of the early church, and it was a powerful thing, and it's something that I, I don't think is unrealistic for us to pray for. In fact, do you remember Peter and John get arrested for healing the lame man? They're severely threatened by the Sadducees. They're let go. The outcome should be we've got to stop talking about Jesus, but we were told in Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 30, this is what they prayed. Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal And that signs and wonders would be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So think of it like this. Gifts of the Spirit are important. But I believe that fruits of the Spirit become a greater display when we're doing it among believers. And and here's the thing. God hardwired us to do life together. And not only that, and I've said it last week, I'm I'm going to repeat this over and over again. Just as one member suffers and the church all suffer, but just as one member is honored, I think not only is God honored and we become an unstoppable force, but I think that's what makes this so powerful. I have your attention right now. You're looking at me, you're hearing me talk, and then we're going to leave here and go about our day. And I have this moment where I can get your attention, and then you go about your day, and it's profound, it's great. Thank you for the sermon, Pastor John. And, and, And I... And I thank you for thanking me and affirm that, hey, it was all the Lord. But you know what's even more powerful? Is that when you see someone brand new in this church, and you're just like, hey, welcome. I, I've never met you before. Hey, my name is such and such. That that oftentimes speaks louder than the pastor. And I'm not saying that in a way to dismiss the word. We're always going to read God's word here. But there's something unique about the church that when you do life together outside of this place, we see power in ways we never thought was possible. And so here's the challenge. After church, introduce yourself to someone. Invite them to lunch. 
invite them to dinner later this week, next week, or whatever it might be, because when we're united together, we become more powerful than we are at sitting in a chair, hear me talk, and then leave. And, and I think that's what was happening as great fear filled the early church in Acts chapter 5, that through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done. But not only that, other stuff took place. Look at verse 13 and 14. I said, love this. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord in multitudes of both men and women. Now, I love that we're seeing God's church unified together. And we see major signs and wonders being done, as well as, as we just read here in the text, that God was increasingly adding to the church. And yet there was some people that were not eager to join the bandwagon uh, because they just found out some of the members had died. I mean, can you imagine that? Like, seriously, imagine yourself and someone's like, hey, you should meet Pastor Peter. He's got some really cool things to say. And you're like, okay. And then, you know, they're walking and you're like, but don't lie to God or you'll die. And it's like, <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to stay home then. This doesn't sound like any, like, no. The text says, none dare to join the apostles, like we just read here in verse 13, because I think the reality, and we need to engrave this into our heart now, Christianity is not just uh, sitting in a church. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I go to church on Sundays. But Christianity becomes a lifestyle. It has to be reflected outside of this place. It has to be reflected with how you spend your money, how you treat your spouse, your kids, your employees, strangers, unbelievers, Christians. And I think what was happening is that the early church in Acts, in the book of Acts, they were men and women filled with integrity. Uh, they were cheerful givers. They were awestruck at God's presence. And they wanted, and they prayed for signs and wonders because they realized God was doing the work. Christianity was viewed as a serious thing. And I've noticed even now, as you may invite people to church, Maybe this is your first time and you're just thinking. You know, Jonathan, honestly, I'm not opposed to the, what you're talking about with that. The issue that I have with the church is that it's filled with hypocrites. It's filled with re religious fanatics. It's filled with rules and regulations. And if I'm going to be honest with you, Pastor John, church is often boring. <laughs> and let me just speak to the heart of that right now, okay? This is why I believe that church shouldn't be this entertaining service that the pastor with the pulpit entertains you, that you are, you're the church. That if anything profound takes place today, it's not necessarily because what I have to say, it's because when you walk into this building, you feel welcomed and you feel loved, not because of me, but because of you. That you each truly invest in the greater part of this thing called Christianity and say, I'm in, John, to the point where I get that people's lives are messy, but I'm all in to the point that I want to love on every human being that walks in here, no matter what stage of life they're in. And, and I, I truly believe it's because of that we will see the church, as we see in verse 14, increasingly added to the Lord, both men and women. And again, I'm not just talking about chairs and a seat. I'm talking how rad would it be to see men and women give their life to the Lord, not because they heard me preach a sermon, but because they heard the gospel from you that Jesus loves you and I'm glad you're here. Because a lot of times I get people don't want to talk to the pastor, but something happens when you guys step in and say, yeah, I know the pastors feel like they're completely unavailable a lot, which I'm not. And then if you see me after service, come talk and I'll, I'd love to pray with you. Same with any of the pastoral staff. But something happens when you step up and you say, you know what, I'm going to be a part of your life. I, man, my life's a mess right now. You know what, I don't care. And I'm willing to be dragged through the mud with you. That's power. That is power. And especially when you see people give their life to the Lord. And inevitably, when you see people gather in the name of Jesus, and this is a definitely true today in 2020, sick people gather together. Let's look at verse 15. Look what it says. The first half of verse 15. Read it with me. They brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches. Just stop there for a second. Again, it makes sense as people are hearing all the cool things that are being done through the apostles, that they're like, let's go see them, inevitably, that people were flooding and flocking and flying to see the disciples in a time when life was hopeless. I mean, to the point that they're lining up with beds and couches and cots for just extreme reasons. Well, how extreme? Well, enough to see this hopes that something will happen, because look at the end of verse 15. 
They were, pr- they were hoping that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Psh, wow, right? I mean, Peter must have an incredibly impressive shadow. I mean, it's no Peter Pan shadow. I mean, but, but really, seriously, if I could just get in his shadow. Now, before we draw any conclusions about verse 15, I need to preface this. Nowhere in the text does it indicate that people were actually healed from Peter's shadow. We're told, look at verse 16, that a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. Look what it says. And they were healed. Not necessarily because of Peter's shadow. It wasn't like they just threw their friends in Peter's shadow and they're all of a sudden better. The only indications that we get from verses 15 and 16 is that people obviously had a high regard for Peter and the apostles and this miracles of signs and works that were being done. And some placed their faith and efficiency even in his shadow. And we're hearing that, and some of us are like, that's kind of crazy. But haven't you noticed that there are people in your life that place their faith and security in probably some crazier things? And you're like, really? That's what you believe? A lot of times that's how people feel when they're talking to you, right? When it comes to Christianity. You really? You believe Jesus was God and he died and rose from the grave? Really? You believe that? But the people that you might interact with, you see that they're placing their hope in things that they're going to just leave them hurt. And I mean, that's the reality. What do you do or what happens when you do place your hope and security in something and it fails you? It leaves you hopeless. But not with Jesus. Jesus. But ne- never with Jesus. Yes, life is hard, and yes, there are waves that come that feel like we're suffocating, but God is always consistently good. We were just singing it all my life. You've been faithful and all my life. You've been so, so good. And there is truth to that, or there's not. And I stand here believing in faith that not only is it true, but I have dedicated my whole life to believing that it's true. All my life, you've been so, so good. And yet people need hope. And that's the reality. If you place your hope and faith in anything but Jesus, you will be disappointed every time. Because jobs end. Insurance claims end. Lives end. We put our hope and security in things, and that's the very essence of what insurance companies do. It's to ensure that you're safe in A, B, and C area. And as great as that might be, The reality is, things change that alter what shouldn't be altered, but Jesus is never altered, and Jesus never changes, and he's the same yesterday, today, today, and forever. That's why we put our hope in him. David, the king of Israel, once said in Psalm 16, 9, Therefore my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope. And in Peter's case here in Acts chapter 5, I... It may sound crazy that one could be healed by the touch of a shadow, but we do know that in Scripture we've seen people try to touch the hem of a garment and expect the same result. Remember the story of Jesus in Matthew 5? Listen to this. Or excuse me, in Luke chapter 8, verse 43 and 44. Some of you know this story. If you don't, listen to this. A woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians could not be healed by any, and then came behind, that's Jesus, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. Now, I need you guys to understand, there wasn't anything magical about the hem of Jesus' garment. This was just what we're seeing, a way that her faith was released. And in the same way, there's no power in Peter's shadow itself. This wasn't the first, and it certainly wasn't going to be the last time we see people try to do something like this in Scripture. Uh, The paralyzed man in John 5 believed that the water in the pool would heal his lameness. Uh, When we get to uh, Acts chapter 19, we're going to see some of the Ephesians believing that, that Paul's clothing had healing power. In fact, when we were in Israel, when we were at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there were moments where people, you know, this is an area they believe that could have been where Jesus died and where he was buried. But what was crazy about this scene, if you've ever been to the, if you were with us when we went in 2018, you see people crying over a stone and they're grabbing their trinkets. 
that they bought in the marketplace and they're rubbing it on the stone to the point that they believe that there's power in a rock where, they, where Jesus may or may not have died. And I'm looking at it and I'm just like, first of all, those were all made in China. Second of all, that's not how it works. And here's the thing, guys. Trusting in shadows is not the wisest thing. What if it was cloudy the day Peter was out? What if it was nighttime? I mean, here's my point. I, I'm not trying to sound ridiculous, but here's my point is that we hope for the best in Christ because, let's be honest, everything else is going to somehow fail us. And somehow, I mean, even if you think about it, the text doesn't say it, that people were lining up in hopes to be just in his shadow. Well, what about the people that were in his shadow and weren't healed? Simply because it's not how, it's not how it works. Jesus is the source of the healing. Every, every time. And Jesus does use men and women to be sources of healing of, over people. And I think I've shared this story when, I think I shared it last week, that when I spoke in Calvary of Albuquerque, a, a, a woman came up to me and she's like, your dad and, and Skip Heitzig prayed over me in 1991 and I had breast cancer, like four, stage four. And your dad and Skip prayed over me and I went to see the doctor. It was completely gone. And so you hear those stories, and it's like, well, yeah, of course, and it's not. The healing source was Jesus. It's always been Jesus. Jesus never disappoints. And as exciting as the time was for the early church, not everyone was happy, because look what happens in verse 17 and 18. The high priest rose up, all of those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a common prison. We learned last week that the Sadducees severely threatened Peter and John. Remember, you can never speak Jesus. You can never teach Jesus. Don't even think about Jesus. And they didn't listen. And I, I just love that. And because they didn't listen, we just found out here in verse 17 that the sect of the, the Sadducees were filled with indignation in, in verse 17. But why were they so mad? I mean, really? They were mad because of what the, the disciples were teaching. Because think about it, guys. Think about this from a historical point. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, had successfully maintained a delicate balance of power between Jews and, you know, devout Jews in, in the Roman Empire. That they have favor with the Roman Empire, governmentally, but, you know, we need to do this in a way so that we can control the temple. But now, all of a sudden, the apostles are teaching a doctrine that is centered on Jesus, and it's changing everything. It's changing everything uh, socially. It's changing everything from a worship. People are giving, you know, they're not selling their homes and giving it to the temple and the temple priests. They're giving it to the apostles because they're believing in this ministry. And so for the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're just so upset. We're losing control. The gospel is changing everything. So I believe that night, as they're, you know, they're realizing we severely threatened them, it did nothing. The apostles are in prison. we got to think of something different. I don't think they expected what would happen next. Look at verse 19. But the angel, but, excuse me, but at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, just stop there for a second, because I know all of you are already thinking it. Really? An angel? Really, an angel. I've told this story before. I told it when we taught through Genesis, and I believe I taught it through Ephesians but I'm going to share it again here in Acts. When I was in high school, I remember we were in a band and we were on our way to a concert, a show to play a concert, and I'm driving and I hit a median and there's a giant speaker in the back of my then 1997 Jetta, smashes the windows, blows the tire out, and then I'm l coming out like a 17-year-old ignorant person, like, I don't know what to do when this happens. And we're looking around, and out of nowhere, a cowboy came and was just like, you need some help? I was like, yes, I do, cowboy wearing Levi jeans. Yes, thank you. Changes the tire and just says, have a nice day. It's nighttime, by the way. I had no idea where he came from. He's just like, have a nice day, and walked away. And my drummer, who was in the car with me at the time, I was like, bro, that was an angel. He's like, it wasn't an angel. I was like, dude, where did he come from? Where did he come from? Angels aren't cowboys and stuff. Maybe, maybe we'll go to heaven and he'll be like, my name's Tom, I wasn't an angel, but thank you for noticing. 
But here's the reality. I don't know if that guy was an angel or not, but what I do know is what Scripture says. Listen to this, Hebrews 13, 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Without even knowing this could happen. And I think that's exactly what happened here with Peter and John, which just would have been wild as they're just sitting there. And then an angel comes and is like, psst, let's go. I'm going to break you out. Which, by the way, it's going to happen again in the book of Acts. This isn't the first jailbreak from an angel. And it's just, it's just wild to me. So what did the angels tell them to do after they were released? So remember, they, they, at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, now look at verse 20, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I, I love that verse. I love the verse. This, what do you want us to do? I need you to go speak to all the people the words of this life. I think I love this verse so much because I, I look at my own life. I look at my life and I realize I, I was a, pres- a prisoner to my flesh. I was a child of wrath. I had condemnation to look forward to, but then Jesus entered my heart. Guys, and he set me free. He opened the prison doors for one reason and one reason only, and that is my purpose in life, your purpose in life. Everyone, we exist so that we can declare the same message that the apostles are asked to declare in verse 20 by the angel, to speak to the people all the words of this life, that Jesus, if he has set you free, then you can give a defense for the hope that is inside of you. You're a Christian, why? This is why. This was my life. That was your life, and this is who you are now? It it, it wasn't me, man. It was the Lord. And that's the beauty of the gospel. That your sin has separated you from a perfect and holy God, and there is nothing you and I can do to change that issue. And because of that, we have condemnation to look forward to. But Jesus said, I'm going to take on the weight of sin and die for you. Well, how did he prove it? Because he rose from the grave three days later to validate Everything he said was in fact true. The words of life is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So what do the disciples do? What do they say in response to the angel? Verse 21, then Peter said, this could get us in a lot of trouble and I'm already on parole. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Next week, we're going to finish Acts chapter 5 and we're going to see the outcome of this story. But with that said, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and end with this last thought. The story of Ananias and Sapphira has numerous lessons to teach us. And really what I think it comes down to, guys, number one, there's value in humility. There's always going to be value in telling the truth that even though you may think you should lie and hide the sin, guys, pride, if that's the driving force and desire, you're going to find that your compromising result to lie and desire respect from people is going to leave you disappointed, but not with Jesus. Bottom line, guys, lies destroy lives every time, period. And that's the hope right now, guys. You don't have to be like Ananias and Sapphira as you're hearing my voice and you're thinking, he's just about to end, and I'm almost done with this. Guys, church shouldn't just exist for you to feel bad in the chair, but if you're feeling convicted, it's not me. It's the Lord maybe working in your heart right now, and not only to work in your heart, maybe God's going to use your life to minister to someone else in ways that I, I, I just can't. But that's the point. You don't have to do it alone. That God may resist the proud, but ladies and gentlemen, he will every single time embrace those who humble themselves.